Now, um, I'm excited about all the topics that we're going to cover. And by the way, I really enjoyed the overview uh, that Rob gave as he covered the grand overview. So what he did was he uh, set the foundation. And what we're going to do now is we're going to start building on that foundation. And Bible prophecy is going to come alive. In fact, you're going to learn so much about Bible prophecy, it's going to blow your socks off. That is, unless you're not wearing socks. I don't know what's going to happen then. Um, but uh, we've covered the first topic, make revelation understandable. Again, that was the foundation. Uh, our next topic, which we're beginning right now, is entitled Kingdoms of Time. Uh, we're going to do this in two parts. I will be giving the first part, and then I will turn it over to Rob, and he will be continuing on the second part. Uh, because we, we are going right through prophecy, and we're going to show you the historicist approach to Bible prophecy. Now, before we, um, before we get into this presentation, can somebody tell me what the historicist approach covers? This was mentioned in the previous lecture. I just want to bring it again. What does historicism mean? I'll tell you, it means that the prophecy begins in the day of the prophet, it starts there, and then it continues all the way down until the end of time. So we're going to look and we're going to fill in. In fact, um, I hope you still have your uh, keys to unlock prophecy. In fact, we went over already the master key, and that is the Bible must be its own what? Interpreter. That is huge. Uh, though we covered that. Now, as we uh, go through the presentation, uh, this presentation, this next presentation, you will want to um, perhaps fill in some of the dates on the back. So you'll want to you'll wanna keep this handy. Now, before we go into the presentation, we, are, of course, are going to be opening the Bible. And every time before we open God's Word, I like to invite the author, God Himself, the Holy Spirit, to be in our midst. So if you would bow your heads with me, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have uh, to study Bible prophecy together this evening. Lord, open our hearts and minds. Pray that you would be our teacher. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. This presentation is entitled, Kingdoms of Time. You might recognize these two individuals. These guys met a long time ago at a battlefield in 1815. Their names, the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon Bonaparte. Now these guys met at a battle. You probably already knew that. But here's what you may not have known is how much these two individuals had in common. Both of them were born in 1769. Both of them were born on an island. Both lost their fathers in early childhood. Both had three sisters and four brothers. Both attended military school in France at the same time. Both became lieutenant colonels within a day of each other. Both of them excelled in math. Both became great commanders over large armies. These men were evenly matched if there ever was an even match. But one of them won and one of them lost. Why is that? Well, some say the geographical features of the battlefield favored Wellington. Others believe Napoleon lost because the Prussian army joined up with Wellington. Others say, oh, you know, the real reason was is Napoleon was really tired. He had just come back from a disastrous excursion into Russia in 1813. He received a pummeling there at Leipzig, and uh, he was just really tired. And that's why he lost. But does anyone really know why Napoleon lost? Well, I would suggest there is one person who knows, and that is God. And God has actually shared with us in the Bible why Napoleon lost. Please come with me this evening to Daniel chapter 
2. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open with me there to Daniel chapter 2. Now, Daniel chapter 2 begins with a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. This is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar. We snuck into his palace and we managed to get a picture. No, it's just an artist depiction, of course. But Nebuchadnezzar built the Neo-Babylonian Empire, and he ruled the Middle East 2,600 years ago. He's a pretty important figure in history, and something happened in Nebuchadnezzar's bedroom one night. And what happened in his bedroom that night would determine history for the next 2,600 years. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream one night. In fact, he was so troubled about the dream that he called in his wise men. Surely they could tell him what it was all about. Despite incentives, promises of rewards, and threats, the wise men simply couldn't do the job. So the king sentenced them all to death. Fortunately, Daniel the prophet came to the rescue, and he did what Babylon's wise men couldn't do. After a prayer session with his close friends, God revealed the same dream to Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar had received in his palatial bedroom the night before. But the difference was Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. He didn't have the interpretation. When God gave Daniel the same dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, he received the interpretation along with the dream. So Daniel is ushered in to the palace of the king. Daniel comes and he stands before Nebuchadnezzar, powerful, powerful man there in the kingdom of Babylon. And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and he said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven. I'm going to stop right there. I like that, don't you? But there is a God in heaven. Not maybe he's up there. Not perhaps he's up there. But there is a God in heaven. And what does this God in heaven do? He reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Those are the very last days of earth's history. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. And then Daniel describes the dream. He said, you, O king, were watching. And behold, a great image. The great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you. And its form was awesome. This image head was of fine gold. What was it, everybody? Fine gold. Its chest and arms of silver. And the passage goes on, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, and partly of clay. Daniel continues on, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And that stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Nebuchadnezzar must have been amazed as Daniel described the image just like he'd seen it in his dream. Yes, the head was of gold. The chest and the arms were of silver. The belly and the thighs were of bronze or brass. The legs were of iron. And the feet, they were a mixture. Remind me, what were they a mixture of? Iron and, you just there looking at the picture on the screen, right? <laughs> iron and clay. That's right. And then, of course, there was a stone that came hurtling through the sky with great speed. And it came and struck the image on its feet, pulverized it, ground it to powder, essentially, and the wind carried the dust away till no trace of it was found. Then, of course, the stone became a great mountain until it filled the whole earth. 
Nebuchadnezzar must have been stunned. But he must have leaned in, eager to know what the interpretation was. Now, what could the dream possibly mean? Now, I want to stop right here and say there are some people who say that you can't understand Bible prophecy. There are some people who say, well, listen, you can't understand it. It's kind of like the weatherman. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they don't. Everybody has their own interpretation, so forget it. But friend, I want to tell you something. The Bible is its own interpreter. And the same God that gave the dream to Daniel and to Nebuchadnezzar gave the interpretation to Daniel. So let's listen this evening to the interpretation that God gave to Daniel. And I want you to notice how historicism comes into play. That word we learned a little bit earlier this evening, historicism. Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. Daniel says, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom and power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You, Nebuchadnezzar, that is your kingdom of Babylon, you are this head of gold. Can you see it? There is no guesswork involved in this interpretation, is there? There is no really interpretation, really. It is simply the Bible telling us exactly what the head of gold on the image represents. Daniel says, you, Nebuchadnezzar, you and your kingdom of Babylon, that represents the head of gold. Clearly, the head of gold represents Babylon. I don't think there's any other possibility. And so, Babylon, we have that great kingdom of Babylon ruled the ancient world from 605 to 539 B.C. Now, that is a date. So you may want to take out your Bible prophecies timeline and, and fill that in there. We have our first date there, 605 B.C. That is when Babylon rose to power. Ancient Babylon was indeed a golden empire. It may have been the wealthiest empire in the history of the world. Gold was lavishly used to embellish the buildings of Babylon. Babylon was a mighty nation. The walls were some 90 feet tall. And historians say that they were wide enough, thick enough, that three chariots could race side by side atop the walls of Babylon. You could have chariot races. The Indy 500 right on top of the walls of Babylon. Imagine that. Why was it so thick? Well, they didn't want enemies to be able to batter through the wall. Now, in, in old times, what, when one army wanted to conquer another nation, what they would do is they would besiege the city. That is, they would just camp around the outside and wait for the people inside to starve to death. Now, if you were going to besiege Indianapolis, what would you have to do? You'd probably have to cut off a bunch of freeways, right? I-69, I-70, uh, I-65, and you just shut them down and wait till everybody surrenders. But Babylon was a mighty nation. It could withstand any siege. Babylon actually had a 20-year food supply. And history tells us that when the, the enemy armies came and surrounded Babylon, they actually threw food over the walls to taunt the enemy. Imagine a sandwich flying over the walls of Babylon. <laughs> Babylonian special, here it comes. Well, Babylon could withstand any siege. It had a 20-year food supply, and moreover, the river Euphrates ran right through the center of Babylon, giving it a constant water supply so they could grow their own food. Think about that. The river Euphrates, that's going to come in to our story a little bit later. But anyways, Babylon was amazing. Its inhabitants could, could withstand any siege. It was also very influential, and Babylonian influence is still with us to today. From ancient Babylon, we get the horoscope. We get the concept of 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 360 degrees in a circle, all from Babylon. But as great and golden as it was, Babylon wouldn't last forever. Notice what the Bible prophecy says would happen next. This is Daniel chapter 2, verse 39. Daniel said, But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's smile of satisfaction must have quickly faded from his face when Daniel said that. Ugh. After me, another kingdom? Inferior? Well, that is what happened in history. Um, we have, and by the way, I wanted to mention this idea of historicism. When did the prophecy begin? 
It began in Daniel's time, right at that time, and then it moves through history. That's the concept of historicism. So we have Medo-Persia, represented by the chest and the arms of silver. Actually, we have another date there, don't we? We could actually put that on our chart. 539 BC is when the kingdom of Medo-Persia rose to power. Now, the Medo-Persians were a coalition government. The Medes and the Persians ruled together. That is why you have the two arms on the image. Bible prophecy is so accurate and astounding. Now, when the Persian general Cyrus approached the city of Babylon, he realized that taking the city wouldn't be an easy task. I mean, he couldn't batter through those walls that were so thick. He couldn't, he couldn't climb over them. And besides, in fact, you couldn't even get near the walls of Babylon because the, the city of Babylon had a moat around the outside. So in other words, you couldn't even get there to batter at the walls without first swimming through a, a moat. And by that time, you know, the people on the top of the wall would have would have shot you with probably burning arrows or something exciting. But there was one weakness to the city of Babylon, and that was the Euphrates River. Well, Cyrus went upstream, and he diverted the river into an ancient dry lake bed, and it became a virtual dry highway right under the walls of Babylon. Now, of course, Babylon was prepared for such an event, and they had inner gates along the river, but the night of the fall of Babylon, uh, the proud grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, his name was Belshazzar, threw a wild party, and those inner gates were carelessly left open. The Bible actually predicted it would happen hundreds of years before in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45. You can read about that sometime. Notice what the next verse says. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. So, we have the thighs of bronze coming next after Medo-Persia. After Medo-Persia. So, we have Greece. After Medo-Persia comes Greece. Now, the thighs of bronze, the Grecian Empire ruled the ancient world from 331 to 168 BC. So, now you have another date you can fill on there. We're, we're moving right through history, right down uh, this image. Now, who led Greece in its conquering of Medo-Persia. Who was that? That is absolutely right. We have a student of history here. Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander conquered 2 million square miles, 20 million subjects, all before his 32nd birthday. He reached the coast of India, and he cried when there was nothing left to conquer. On the way back to Greece, Alexander died suddenly in his sleep. Some believe he drank himself to death. If so, Alexander conquered the world, but he couldn't conquer his own addictions. So if you're struggling with some addiction tonight, you need more than military power. You need the power of Christ in your life. Now, what empire would become, uh, what would become of the Greek empire would Greece rule forever? No, obviously not, because, you know, Greece doesn't rule the world today. It's not a ruling power today. The Bible prophecy goes on. We're moving right through it rather quickly here. Daniel 2, verse 40, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Did this part of the prophecy come true? Yes, it did. In the Battle of Pydna in 168 B.C. We have another date, the Battle of Pydna, 168 B.C. Uh, we have the glorious kingdom of Alexander the Great, of course, came to an end. Rome ruled the world from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. We have the next world empire, the Roman Empire. Now, Rome ruled the world when Jesus was born. Jesus was born, he lived, he died, he was crucified, he rose from the dead during the time of a Roman occupation. Now, we owe a lot to Rome even today. We owe uh, our legal and political structures uh, to the Roman power. Notice the words of the historian uh, this evening. This is from the renowned historian Edward Gibbon. The images of gold silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Isn't that interesting? 
the secular historian uses images of gold, silver, brass that might serve to represent. You think he read Daniel chapter 2. Maybe he did. So the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2 has brought us all the way, using historicism now, to the Roman Empire. Is that clear to everybody? Is that clear? All right, what's next? As we make our way down Nebuchadnezzar's dream, what happens next? This is interesting. Daniel chapter 2, verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom, that is Rome, shall be divided. Now, was the Roman Empire divided? Yes, it was. In fact, that is what was represented by the two legs of the Roman Empire. You had the, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire. It was divided. But Rome became even more divided as you get down into the feet and the toes of the image. How many toes does a man have? Ten, unless you've got a little too close to the lawnmower, right? Most Men and women have ten toes. Guess what? When the Western Roman Empire collapsed, historians describe ten factions coming from its collapse. So you can see the detail in this prophecy is really incredible. Now here are the ten factions that came from Rome. They emerged when the Roman Empire divided. The Anglo-Saxons became the British. The Franks became France. The Visigoths became Spain. The Suevi became Portugal. The Burgundians became Switzerland. The Alemanni became Germany, the Lombards became Italy, and the Herali, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths are three tribes that no longer exist today, and we're going to find out why in just a few moments, even in this next presentation that we're going to be having tonight. Now here comes the part that has determined the course of history like nothing else possibly could, like who wins wars, like who sits on the thrones. And here's who determined who won the battle of Waterloo. Here it is in verse 43. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. Bible prophecy predicted that when Europe was divided into those ten divisions, that the the Europe would remain divided, that the powers would not stick together, they would not adhere together. And that is why you, we do not have in our world tonight the United States of Europe. So God was right. God was right. Or can prophecy be proven wrong? Well, let's check on European history for just a moment. Queen Victoria was called the grandmother of Europe. Why is that? Because she was related to every other European head of state through intermarriage. They quite literally mingled with the seed of men, as the Bible says. But that did not, did not unite Europe, did it? Charlemagne was called the father of Europe, but he couldn't bring lasting peace to the continent. Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, in 1519, his reach expanded to 1.5 million square miles. Powerful man. But gout and malaria ended his life, and with it, his ambitions of uniting all of Europe. Louis XIV of France tried and failed. Well, of course he did. Anybody would fail wearing that, right? <laughs> and then came Napoleon. He almost pulled it off. Almost, almost united all of Europe. But then came the Battle of Waterloo. In the 20th century, it was Kaiser Wilhelm and World War I. Why did Germany lose World War I? God said they will not adhere to one another. Hitler had served in Kaiser's army. He felt humiliated, and he swore he'd do something about it. He said, I'll finish what Napoleon started. I'll build an empire. I'll establish a Reich that will last a thousand years. It, re it was reported once that Hitler was shown the prophecy here in Daniel chapter 2. And if that is true, we don't know if it is, but if that was true, then he went on defying the will of God didn't seem to matter. In uh, March of 1941, 
Adolf Hitler stated, See, my people, we do not need anything from God. We do not ask him for anything except that he may let us alone. We want to fight our own war with our own guns without God. We want to gain our victory without the help of God. Hitler knew he couldn't count on God to help him. What he may not have known, or what he found out, is that he couldn't do it. Because God said it wouldn't happen. They will not adhere to one another. You know, those seven words stopped Hitler in his tracks. They will not adhere to one another. God said they won't stick together. After World War II, the Soviet Union tried to rule the world. They brought nation after nation after nation under the control of communism. At one point, one-third of the Earth's geography was communist. But then in 1989, it all fell apart. Because God said they will not adhere to one another. They won't stick together. Now we have the so-called European Union, which is an unstable economic alliance at best. We certainly don't call it the United States of Europe, do we? No, they remain separate countries because God said they will not stick together. Now then, does that mean that there will never be a new world order that unites people under one leader? Well, we can't forget about the rest of the prophecy, can we? Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So there is another kingdom coming, a kingdom that is permanent, a kingdom that is lasting, a kingdom that will never need replacing, and that one will stand forever. That is the kingdom that was represented, by the way, by the stone that came and struck the image on its feet and ground it to powder, and the wind blew it away without a trace. And then, remember what the prophecy stated, that great stone became a great mountain until it filled the whole earth. I want to tell you something this evening. That stone represents the second coming of Jesus and the establishment of his eternal kingdom. Now the question this evening is, does anything else happen between the dividing of Europe and the coming of the stone? Well, I want to tell you something this evening. We're just getting ready for part two. And, I, and before I turn it over to Rob to continue, because he's going to continue the, the story here this evening, I want to say that Daniel chapter 2 in this great image serves as the foundation to understanding a historicist approach to Bible prophecy. It, you could say, is the backbone to Bible prophecy. And in the lectures that are coming up, Rob and myself, we're going to put meat on the skeleton. And there is a principle in Bible prophecy. In fact, I believe it is on the back of your sheet here. Um, it's number four. The fourth key to unlocking prophecy is the principle of repeat and what? Enlarge. So what God does, he gives one prophecy, he gives you some details, but then he gives another very similar prophecy, follows the same historicist approach, but God adds many more details. So we're going to look at the next prophecy next uh, from, uh, well, I'm not going to start sharing the message. I'm excited about it. I know you're going to enjoy it. So Rob, why don't you come on up? And uh, we're going we're gonna to continue right on with the story. And we're going to look at more, more prophecies that add more details to these events that are going to happen right before the coming of Jesus, right after the dividing up of Europe. The Bible's going to add more details there. going to answer questions right now because we're on a tight schedule, but here's what I want to encourage you to do. Write that question down, and we will spend a little time, hopefully tomorrow we'll have a little extra time in the schedule. By the way, anybody else have questions, write them down, and we want to we wanna answer those uh, questions for you. We want to make sure we cover those. Okay, thank you, Jaron. 
<clears throat> Pastor Jaron for sharing that part of Daniel chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> do you guys have your dates filled in now here? Should be 605, should say time of Babylon. 539 should say time of Medo-Persia, because we're doing kingdoms of time. That's the na name of this presentation. So time of Medo-Persia, 539. 331, you want to skip over 457, we haven't talked about that yet. So 331, time of Greece. And then 168 <clears throat> B.C. would be time of Rome, pagan Rome, time of pagan Rome there. Okay? And then if you want to drop down to uh, 476 A.D., that would be the time of divided Rome. That's when Rome was divided up into the ten uh, different parts by 476 A.D. So, look at that. We got five entries, right? And as we've been promising, as we are... I thought of a good word for this. We're binging on Bible prophecy, right? <laughs> so, by the time we're done, we're going to have 21 of these events here on our timeline that we're going to be able to look at and see confirmed in history. Okay, <clears throat> so let's continue on. According to the principle of repetition and enlargement, we are now going to look at the first repetition and enlargement of what we just saw there in chapter 2 of Daniel. And these words ought to just roll off your tongue by the time you're done. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Let's say that together. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Those are the four great world empires, then Rome was divided into the ten parts that grew into Western Europe today, all right? So, let's go to the first repeating now and enlarging of Daniel 2. We find it in Daniel 7, where Daniel has a very similar vision to the one we read in chapter 2. So, let's pay very careful attention to the details here. Beginning in verse 2, it says, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven, they were stirring up the great sea. And remember this, four great beasts came up from the sea. Each one was different from the other. So Daniel sees four beasts arising from the sea. How many metals were there in chapter 2? There were four, right? This is a repetition. And he's told specifically what the four beasts here represent. In verse 17, the angel said to Daniel, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. As the Bible interprets itself, it is clear these beasts and prophecy represent kings, kingdoms, political powers. Verse 23 makes it very clear when it says the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. And as I said, we use similar symbolism today, representing nations and political powers on earth today with different beasts, different animals as we saw. Now, what we discover in Daniel chapter 7 is that this prophecy is repeating what we saw in chapter 2. That chapter featured four great successive world empires, right? Let's review them again. Babylon, Medo-Persia, <laughs> Babylon, Medo -Persia, Greece, and Rome. I said that should roll off your tongue. It wasn't rolling off my tongue, but Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, let's take a closer look at these four beasts or four kingdoms that Daniel saw. Verse 4, he says, the first was like a what? Lion. It had eagle's wings. Anybody ever seen a lion with eagle's wings? I don't think so. This is a symbol. But this one represents the first kingdom. Now, what was the first kingdom back in chapter 2? That, of course, was Babylon. Well, guess what? The walls of ancient Babylon were actually covered with pictures on tiles of lions with wings on their backs. And you can see these tiles at the British Museum in London today where they took the Ishtar Gate entering to Babylon there, archaeological excavation. They carried it off to the museum. What's on the lion there? Wings. So the wing lion was actually a symbol that Babylon employed to represent their own kingdom at the time. In Jeremiah 4.13, it says, the horses of the Babylonians were swifter than eagles. So Babylon is the winged lion and also the golden head back there in chapter 2. Now let's look at the second beast. In verse 5, suddenly Daniel said another beast, a second one like a what? A bear. Not an ordinary bear, though. This one was lopsided. It was raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said to it, Arise, 
and devour much flesh. Okay, what was the second world empire in prophecy? Medo-Persia, that's right. Why is the bear raised up on one side? Well, Medo-Persia was a two-sided power, remember that? But the Persians were stronger, and they were more numerous than the Medes, and so it's a lopsided coalition, the bears raised on one side. Now, why three ribs in the mouth of the bear? Well, history tells us that Babylon had three key provinces. They were Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. And the Persians managed to capture all three of those major provinces of Babylon, three ribs in the bear's mouth. They represent Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. They were gobbled up, you might say, by Medo-Persia. And so we're seeing here, aren't we? We're seeing a repetition and a bit of an enlargement here on what we saw back in chapter 2. Different symbols, each symbol conveying something about the kingdom that it signifies. It's quite fascinating. Verse 6, after this I looked and there was another, the third one, like a what? Leopard, it had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. What was the third great empire of prophecy? That was Greece. Who was the leader of Greece? Alexander the Great. Why are there four wings on the leopard and only two wings on the lion? Well, Greece was twice as fast as Babylon, as Alexander, using lightning warfare, conquered the world in only four short years of time. Now, on the leopard, there are how many heads? Four heads. What would those signify? Well, when Alexander died, they decided to divide up the Greek Empire into guess how many parts? Four parts, which were controlled by Alexander's four military generals. Their names were Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. They took north, south, east, and west. They are the four heads on the leopard there representing Greece. So the leopard is Greece, same as the bronze waist and thighs we encountered there back in Daniel 2. Now, what kingdom would you expect next? That would have to be Rome, right? Well, let's look at the next verse. Verse 7 says, After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast. It was dreadful. It was terrible. It was exceedingly strong. It had huge, there it is, iron teeth. What represented Rome in chapter 2? Iron legs. This beast has iron teeth. It's stronger than the other beast, as Rome was stronger than the other empires that came before it. These are clear references to the strength and power of the pagan Roman Empire under the Caesars. Now, verse 7 says, The fourth beast was different from all the beasts before it. It had how many horns? Ten horns. All right, now what do the ten horns represent, do you suppose? Well, verse 24 tells us the ten horns are ten kings that arise from this kingdom. Remember Western Rome was divided into how many parts? Ten parts, represented by the ten toes when it fell to the barbarian onslaught against pagan Rome. And so how many can see here the consistency? You see the consistency of Bible prophecy? Going over the same ground, same information, different symbols, adding and enlarging. All right, the sequence of empires always remains intact, and it is totally, totally verifiable by simply looking at what? History, because prophecy is only history told in advance. The ten horns match up very nicely with the ten toes back in chapter 2. All right, the toes and the horns point to a divided Roman empire. And remember, the ten toes and the horns evolved into the nations of Western Europe as we know them today. All right, that was a quick review of the four great world empires of prophecy. Let's say it again just for fun. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Thank you. Okay. Now, prophecy is going to break some new ground now, so we need to go a little more slowly. In verse 8, I was considering the horns, Daniel says, and there was another horn, a little one, that was coming up where? among them. So Daniel sees a little horn coming up among the ten. That is where? Western Europe. And since it comes up after the other ten horns are already there, it had to arise after 476 AD, which is that date on your sheet. 
So we're looking for a kingdom, we're looking for a power arising in Western Europe sometime after 476 A.D. Now verse 8 says, When the little horn came up, three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And Daniel noticed in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and it had a mouth. And the mouth was speaking pompous words. All right, We know the little horn eliminated three of the other ten. It had eyes like a man, and in the ancient world's eyes represented intelligence, wisdom, craftiness, that sort of thing. The little horn also had a mouth, and Daniel heard the little horn speaking pompous, arrogant, boastful, proud types of words. So who or what does the little horn here in Daniel 7 represent? Well, guess what? The little horn, as I said in the first presentation, actually is the same as the famous beast of Revelation chapter 13. Remember that? Check it out. Revelation 13, 1 to 3. I stood on the sand of the sea. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten... How many horns? Horns. By the way, if you added up all the heads on the four beasts, it would actually equal seven. Because there were four on Greece, right? Right? And upon his horns there were ten what? Crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The beast, he says, I saw was like a, uh uh-oh, leopard, feet like the feet of a bear, mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. So it's interesting that Daniel was in Babylon, right, looking forward to all these kingdoms that would come in the future. John is writing in the time of Rome, and he's looking backward at kingdoms that had already risen and fallen before his time. So Daniel saw the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon, and John sees the beasts in reverse order, essentially. So the beast in Revelation 13 there, it comes after Babylon, after Medo-Persia, after Greece, and after pagan Rome. Just as the little horn came up after Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. Now, we have some additional characteristics of the Beast of Revelation 13 also that exactly match the little horn of Daniel 7. Both the little horn and the beast speak blasphemous, boastful words. Both persecute the saints of God. Both rule for a prophetic time of 42 months or 1,260 days. So what we have, folks, is we have two symbols representing the same kingdom, the very same power, in different ways. And Bible scholars for centuries have acknowledged that these two symbols, as I said, represent the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. Now, we don't have quite enough information to identify this power just yet, but we do know that the same power appears in Daniel 7 and in Revelation 13. Can you see that tonight? Yes? Are you with me? Same power in Daniel 7, Revelation 13. Okay. Here's what we know about the little horn so far. It's a little kingdom, and it comes up among the nations of Western Europe. It appears after 476 A.D., and it destroys how many? Three of the other ones are plucked up by the roots when it comes. What else are we told? Well, verse 24, Daniel saw the little horn was different from the first horns uh, in some significant way. And so it's a different type of kingdom. Now, what else? Well, he speaks pompous words against the Most High. Some translations say he speaks great words. Revelation 13 puts it this way. He had a mouth speaking great things and what? Blasphemies. All right, now, this kingdom speaks blasphemy, and blasphemy is a religious word, so this kingdom here has a religious aspect about it that's different. Now, what is blasphemy? Is blasphemy just bad language? Is blasphemy just swearing and saying, you know, speaking curse words? Is that what blasphemy is? Well, we got to let the Bible give its own interpretation, right? And so it says, uh, well, we know that in John's day, blasphemy had a very specific meaning. Of course, John, a disciple of Jesus, had heard Jesus accused of blasphemy many times himself, right? So, Here's one instance of blasphemy charge leveled against Jesus. The Jews Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we don't stone you, but for what? Blasphemy, because you being a man, 
make yourself God. So blasphemy in a biblical sense is for a man, a sinful man, a common man, to make himself equal to God. Now, Jesus did that, but he had the credentials to back it up. What do you say? It was not blasphemy when he said that. But no one else can say that, though, right? When you think about blasphemy as having the attributes of God, you remember what Paul said here when speaking about the Antichrist power. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, that he would oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he sits as God where? In the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And when Paul talks about the temple, he's always talking about the church. A man in the church presenting himself as equal with God. Now, here's another time they said Jesus spoke blasphemy. Mark 2, 7, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Did Jesus have the power to forgive sins? Yes, but no one else can, right? Evidently, the little horn says it can. So it speaks great words of blasphemy, a man making himself equal to God, forgiving sin. And then it says this, the little horn would persecute the saints of the Most High. So the little horn persecutes God's faithful people here on earth. And notice how Revelation 13 confirms this. In verse 7 it says, It was granted to him, that is the beast here, to make war with who? The saints and to overcome them. So this power, the little horn in Daniel 7, the beast of Revelation 13, the antichrist of prophecy, forces people to worship according to its dictates, as though it is operating with the authority of God himself. And then we learn that it is a persecuting power. Well, we just covered that. What else? Well, if you look there, it says the little horn would intend to change, what? Times and law. Now, this power would be so boastful and proud as to say that it could change or tamper with God's law, especially God's law that deals with time. All right, so let's add that to the list. It thinks to change times and law. And then it says in verse 25 that the little horn, the saints would be given into his hand for a time times and half a time. Now we're going to have to do a little bit of math, okay? I hope it's not too late. We've got to do a little math. How long is a time, times, and half a time? Well, in the Bible, a time is an expression of a year. In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar went insane for seven times, and it represented seven years, all right? So a time is a year. Times would be two years, and half a time would be a half a year. So a time, times, and half a time added up, what do you get? Three and a half years. Now, this is a period of time that shows up all over the place in Bible prophecy. In fact, it's like seven instances in Daniel and Revelation that talks about this time period right here. Very important. It's the same amount of time in Revelation 13, 5. It says the beast was given authority to continue how long? 42 months. What's that? Three and a half years, right? Okay, so three and a half years, 42 months, other places. It calls it 1,260 days. Are you with me? Same period, 1,260 days, 42 months, time, times, and half a time. Now, here's a good question. What does a day represent in Bible prophecy? I don't know if we put this one on our sheet. Yes, we did. Okay, in Bible prophecy, now we should take things literally in the Bible unless there's a good reason to take them symbolically or metaphorically. Now, when you take these time prophecies literally, you find no significant events, no fulfillments, nothing at all. But when you take this principle, and it's a long-established principle of interpreting prophecy of a day representing a year of time on earth, you see amazing fulfillments of accurate predictions fulfilled in history that, as Pastor Jaron said, blows your socks off. So here's a good question. What does a day represent? A year in prophecy. 
Jesus told the church of Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2 that they would suffer persecution for 10 days. That doesn't seem like very long, but it was actually 10 years under Diocletian from 303 to 313 A.D. So this is a fairly prominent feature of Bible prophecy. You find it all over the place, as I said. We get it from Ezekiel 4, 6, where God said, I've laid on you a day for what? A day for each year. All right, so this little horn, we add that to the list, it reigns for 1,260 days or prophetic years. Now, when you look at that list of clues, and by the way, do you think God wants us to know who the little horn power is? He gives us more information about this one than all the other ones, it seems, combined. So yes, God wants us to be able to figure this out. And when you look at that list there, a small kingdom among the nations of Western Europe coming up after 476 A.D., destroying three of the ten horns when it rose to power. Different type of kingdom. It's uh, a man leading it, speaking great words, blasphemous words, putting itself in the place of God, forgiving sin, persecuting the saints of God, trying to change God's law, and then reigning for a long period of time of 1,260 years. Now, most of you who know some history, probably have this all figured out already. This is describing the Christian church during what we call the dark, what? Dark ages of history. It's interesting, friends, that the biggest problem that prophecy points to isn't necessarily atheists, unbelievers, communists, agnostics, or Muslims. The biggest issue in Bible prophecy is actually apostasy taking place where? within the church. Now, this is nothing new in our time because Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 are simply describing the state of Christianity as it existed historically during the Dark Ages. Now, in the Old Testament, what is the Old Testament normally pointing the finger at? The heathen nations? No, God's usually pointing the finger at Israel because of their apostasy. That was the church in the Old Testament, right? And the New Testament points the finger at apostate Christianity. In Israel and in the church, compromise with pagan culture brought in some terrible things. And as we might as well face it, because history holds all the evidence that we need. So let's ask the question, did Christianity create a small kingdom that was religious and political in Western Europe? sometime after pagan Rome's fall and dividing up? It did. And guess what? It's still there. You see, after Constantine's so-called conversion in 313 AD, the Christian church actually turned into a political power. How many knew this? Did you know this history? In other words, there was a marriage of the church and the what? State. And it was a marriage of convenience. So did the Christian church-state combination rise to power after 476? Yes, it arose in 538 AD. In fact, I think that might be on your, yeah, 538 AD. You want to write that down? We would call that the time of papal Rome. Up there in uh, 168, that was the time of pagan Rome, but now in 538 we have the rise of papal Rome in Western Europe. Now, did this Christian kingdom destroy three of the barbarian tribes of Western Europe? Yes, it did. And when did that happen? Well, the emperor Justinian over in Eastern Rome, he uh, handed the keys of Western Rome to the bishop of Rome in 533 A.D., There it is, 533, the Emperor Justinian gave political authority over the West to the Bishop of Rome. Justinian crowned the Bishop of Rome as head of all the holy churches. And since since Justinian was so busy over in the eastern part of the empire, he gave the West over to the church. But there were some barbarian tribes over there that resisted this appointment of the Bishop of Rome, giving him all that power. And they were the Heruli the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. So the Bishop of Rome then took Justinian's army and made war against the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, 
and eliminated them completely to the point where they have no descendants left today. They were plucked up by the roots. In 493, they defeated the hairy lie. They no longer exist. That's one horn plucked up by the roots. In 534, it was the vandals in northern Africa. They were a fierce tribe from where we get the word vandalism today, but the armies of Rome were no match. I'm sorry, were too much for the vandals. They ceased to exist in 534. That's two horns plucked up by the roots. And then finally in 538, the Ostrogoths were destroyed and never heard from again. So that was three horns plucked up by the roots. What were they? Hairy lie, vandals, and the Ostrogoths. So by 538 then, all the opposition was rooted out and the authority of Rome's bishop was completely unquestioned. The Roman bishop now had unchecked political authority over the West. And then the Christian church began calling all the shots in all the affairs of Europe for many centuries of time. In fact, the bishop of Rome was actually given the title of the definer of doctrine, the head of all the churches, and the corrector of heretics. And being the uh, corrector of heretics, you can imagine the persecution that began to occur. So was the Christian kingdom different than the other powers of Western Europe? Yes, it was different in that it was ruled by clergy. It was a religious kingdom that used the state to compel people to worship in a certain fashion. And that was unique and very different than anything that had come before it. Now, did the Christian kingdom speak these blasphemous words that John and Daniel heard speaking? Well, this is kind of hard to look at, guys, but to be honest, it did. Let's look at some unfortunate examples here. Uh, Pope Leo XIII here in his encyclical letter, page 304, said, We hold on this earth the place of God Almighty. Pius X said, The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus, but he is Jesus Christ, hidden under the veil of flesh. Now, let's face it, that's not something anybody should be saying, should they? But it happened time and time again. Here's one that says, For thou art our shepherd, thou art physician, thou art the governor, thou art the husbandman, and thou finally art another god on earth. End of quote. Now that's what Marcellus said to Julius II. You might think that Marcellus would be rebuked for that, but he was actually applauded because that's what the church was teaching at this time in history. Boniface VIII said, I am all in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the vicar of God, have both one consistory, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. Well, Daniel heard boastful words, right, coming out of the mouth of the little horn, and so did John there, the beast of Revelation 13. Seems to fit the prophecy. Ferrari's Ecclesiastical Dictionary, Volume 6, says, The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted, he's not a mere man, but as it were God. Pope is called most holy because he's rightfully presumed to be such, and hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as a king of heaven and of earth and the lower region. Moreover, the superiority, it says, the power of the Roman pontiff by no means pertain only to heavenly things, to earthly things and to things under the earth, but are even over angels than whom he is greater. So that if it were possible that angels might err from the faith, they could be judged and excommunicated by the Pope. He is of so great dignity and power and forms one and the same tribunal with Christ so that whatever the Pope does seems to proceed from the mouth of God. The Pope is, as it were, he said, God on earth. So, does this fit the prophecy of boastful words? Well, I think it does, doesn't it? Pretty clearly. Now, was the medieval church a persecuting power? Most people familiar with history can answer that question in the affirmative. If you you don't know that Christians have persecuted, just start reading some of the books that are written by modern atheists today. They'll be glad to point it out to you. (laughs) Yeah, the church has persecuted. Christians have been slow to admit it and apologize for it, but we cannot deny that it happened. The Western Watchman, the church said that the church has persecuted and only a tyro in church history would deny that. Now, here's what it looked like back in the darkest days of the church. 
This is a page from Ecclesiastical Law we're reading there, volume 2, page 142. It says, the church may by divine right confiscate the property of what? Heretics, imprison their persons, and condemn them to the flames. All right, so I don't know if you knew this, but during the Dark Ages, it's been estimated that the church actually killed as many as 50 million people just because they believe differently. All right, the church may by divine right confiscate property and so forth. Unfortunately, the church began to punish ideas even more severely than actual crimes. Now, friends, this is why it's so important that we follow the Lamb. What do you say? We've got to follow the Lamb because Jesus has the spirit of grace and mercy and the love of God, right? That's the true spirit of Christianity. We have to submit to Jesus rather than try to take his place because none of us are qualified to have the place of authority in the church. Jesus alone is the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Now, let me say this. I would not say that this is an indictment of any person or any group of people, but rather talking about a system that is designed to put a man too high and give too much power and authority. And we've seen, you've heard the statement that power does what? Corrupts and absolute power can have a tendency to corrupt absolutely. All right, so there's no question about the persecution or this one here. What about th changing times and law? Back in 1661, Pope Nicholas said, Wherefore, no marvel if it be in my power to dispense with all things, yea, with the precepts of Christ. This one says the Pope has power to change times, abrogate laws. That sounds like it comes right out of Daniel, doesn't it? He would think to change times and laws. And it says, dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Here it says the authority of the church could therefore not be bound by the authority of the Scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by command of Christ, but by its own authority. So here the church is claiming the authority to change God's law, especially the law dealing with the day of worship. And so we see these fulfillments happening here down through history, matching up clearly with these descriptions that we're digging out of Daniel and Revelation. Now, what about the 1260 days or prophetic years? Does anybody remember what year the, the Ostrogoths were defeated? What year do we say? 538. Right? 538, and that's on your chart there. 538. Now, if you start with 538 and say, that was really the beginning of the papal supremacy when the Pope was given the title head of the churches, definer of doctrine, corrector of heretics, 538 is a key date. So if you go 1260 years from 538, where will you arrive? Well, you're going to come to um, 1798, right? I don't know why it's not coming up on my screen. Is it on your chart? Okay, it, it should say 1798. So, did anything significant happen in 1798? Well, we should see a breaking of Papal Rome's power there at the end of this period. Did it happen? Well, in 1798, what happened was Napoleon, who Pastor Jaron was talking about, what was Napoleon trying to do? He was trying to conquer Europe and bring it under his control, right? But a big obstacle over there in Rome was preventing him from doing that. And so Napoleon sent his general, his name was Berthier, into Rome to capture the Pope. Can you believe it? And he succeeded. They captured him. They took him out of Rome. They drug him off to France. They put him in prison, and the Pope died in exile in France in what year? 1798. Exactly 1260 years after it all began in 538. So the church's power over Western Europe was finally broken right on schedule. All right, so we seem like we have a perfect match here between history and prophecy. The medieval Christianity in the Dark Ages perfectly fits the bill as we go through these clues. Now remember, remember what I said at the first presentation that God reveals uh, kingdoms and powers as they intersect with his people and as they affect 
God's grand plan of salvation centered in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, right? And God reveals the good aspects and the bad aspects of nations and religions. They're all revealed. There's no looking at it through rose-colored glasses. So when we, we read a prophecy in the Bible, we got to let it interpret itself, and then we just look for that historical fulfillment and see if there's a match. Now, I want you to see this quote here up on the screen. I'll read a couple of them here in closing, but it says, in The Blessed Hope by George Ladd, he said, quote, many of the great Christians of Reformation and post-Reformation times shared this view of prophetic truth and identified Antichrist with the Roman papacy. Now, let me stop there because you see the word Antichrist? When we hear the word anti in English, we tend to think what? Something against something, right? Like antifreeze, antiperspirant, right? Well, in Greek, which the, which the Bible, the New Testament was written in Greek, the, the word anti actually is better translated as in place of or instead of. So Antichrist means instead of Christ, and these people reading the Bibles and looking at what was happening in Rome said, wait a minute, a man is being put where? In the place of Christ, in the church, and given too much authority and power. Now it says, among the adherents of this interpretation were the Waldenses, the Hussites, Wycliffe, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, Philip Melanchthon, William Tyndale, Hugh Latimer, and Nicholas Ridley, and we could add to the list. Okay, so they were looking at the same Bibles we're looking at. They were using the historicist method of interpretation, and they said, wow, look at that. Something's happened there in Rome. This one says, leaders such as Luther and Calvin and Knox and Cranmer pointed to Daniel what? 7, same place we're looking, and Revelation 17 and Revelation 13, and they identified the great apostasy with headquarters in Rome. Now, it says the scriptural message of Revelation 18.4 formed the basis of many of their sermons. And what were their sermons saying? Come out of her, my people. Where are God's people? God's people were in there, right? Because God has people everywhere. Amen? Do you believe that? I believe God has people in all different religions and churches and nations and kingdoms. And he's just calling us to follow the Bible and live by the word of God and not follow man. All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semelin, a more recent book. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, and Cranmer in the 17th century. John Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. The translators of the King James Bible, men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confessions of Faith. The scientists, how many knew Isaac Newton was a student of prophecy? Yeah, he was. John Wesley, who started the Methodist Church. Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist in England, Bishop J.C. Ryle, Martin Lloyd-Jones, these men, among countless others, all saw the office. They saw the what? It was the office. Not the person, but the office. We shouldn't have that office in the place of Christ as head of the church. The Reformers and their heirs were scholars, and they knew the Word of God and the Holy Spirit as a living teacher. Newsweek magazine, I found this back in 1999, interesting, it says Martin Luther was the first to identify the papacy as such with the Antichrist. At first he discounted the value of John's apocalypse. Luther didn't have much use for the book of Revelation until he saw in it a revelation of the church of Rome, a view that was to become dogma for what? All the Protestant churches. Okay, so this is nothing new. This is something that people understood very clearly uh, not that long ago. Now, before I let you go, here's something kind of troubling. Prophecy says, folks, that this type of Christian kingdom that we're studying about tonight is going to make a comeback in the last days. How do we know that? Let's read Revelation 13, 3. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally what? Wounded. When did that happen? 1798, when the Pope was captured. But then it says the deadly wound was what? Healed. And it gets healed to the point that all the world marveled and followed the beast. So let me ask you, are we going to see this union of church and state again? Are we going to see Christianity trying to assume political power? 
How will this wound be healed fully? Well, we're going to find out tomorrow afternoon when we have a topic called the mark of the beast. Don't miss that. Because prophecy predicts exactly how that's going to happen. So you need to be here tomorrow as the prophetic story continues to unfold. But for now, let's just make sure that we make Jesus the head of the church. What do you say? Is that fair enough? Let's give him the office of head of the church. Let him be the definer of doctrine. If he wants to correct anybody, let him be the corrector. Amen? And let's pray to be filled with the Spirit of Christ ourselves, that we might faithfully represent him to the world around us, that we not blaspheme his name by calling ourselves Christians and acting like the devil. And finally, let's realize, as I said earlier, that God does have people in different kingdoms, different religions. He's calling all his people to unite around the truth of his word, not the laws and dictates of man, no matter how authoritative they might be if they contradict the law of God and his word. What do you say? Sound fair? Okay. Now, let's have a prayer, and then I'm going to tell you one more thing. Father in heaven, we thank you for all we've learned tonight. What, a, what an adventure, what a journey through prophecy and history we've taken here in just two hours. And Lord, thank you for all you've shown us. We can begin to see where we are in prophetic time. We have all these prophecies now behind us, fulfilled. We're anxious to see what's coming in the future as we continue to dig into the book of Revelation. So Lord, just bless us with the Holy Spirit of God. Make us like Jesus in our characters. Help us represent him well in our world today. Forgive our sins, Lord. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness. May the gospel be the power of God to salvation for each one of us gathered here. Bless us with a good night's sleep. Bring us back tomorrow eager and ready to learn again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, get a good night's sleep because tomorrow at 10, what time? 10. 10. Dates with destiny. We're digging into Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Pastor Jaron and I will be sharing that one. And then at 11.15, the four horsemen, the seven seals. Lunch at 12.30 and then look at that lineup tomorrow afternoon. Don't miss a single one. And by the way, we still have some of these smaller versions of these out there. I don't want to throw those away. So take those with you, give them to somebody, and try to think of a friend you could bring here tomorrow to enjoy what you've been learning. And uh, good night. God bless you. Take care. generation to generation passed down through every age there's a story of a savior whose love will never change all creation will bow before him every tongue will praise his name until the day he comes again we will say